Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. Welcome to our Good Friday service this morning. We're going to begin. We want to just reflect, remember, sing, and, and I hope come with 
just gratitude for what Jesus has done on the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross. And today, yes, we commemorate, we remember a, a death. His death. The death that marked and brought salvation to the world. But we can declare that it is a good Friday because of what he did. Why don't you stand with us this morning as we just begin the service together today.
this time I'm going to ask Gary and Gail Kyle to come up and open our service with the scripture reading from Isaiah. Isaiah 53, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up and before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her is, its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And he was made, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. <coughs> Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and they sh he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall, be, shall prosper in his hand. He will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I divide him a portion for the great, and he will divide a, por a spoil for the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he numbered with the transgressors, he bore the sin of many in the transgressions and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's continue to worship this morning. the 
transgression but thine the deadly pain lo here I fall my Savior tis I deserve thy place look on me with thy face Safe to me, thy grace. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying soul? From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. This is our God. Servant King, He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. There in the Garden of Tears. chose to bear his heart with sorrow was torn yet not my will but yours he said this is our God the servant king he calls us now to follow As a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Come see his hands and his feet, the scars that speak of sacrifice hands that flung stars into space to cruelness surrendered this is our God the servant king he calls us now to follow him to bring our life as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. So let us learn how to serve and in our lives and throne him each other's needs to prefer.
from Mark chapter 15, the account of the death of Jesus. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Aloi, Aloi, lama sepakatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Father, you sent your Son into this world to die for our sins. He is the Son of God, fully God and fully man. He came and he sacrificed his life. Father, thank you for laying down your Son that way. Jesus, thank you for being willing and saying, not my will, but yours be done. Your sacrifice made it possible for us all to come to you. You became the great mediator between God and us. Thank you, Lord, for dying on that cross for saying it is finished, and for having the victory over death. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated here this morning. Well, thank you for joining us this morning for this Good Friday service here in person. You're joining us online as well. And today I want to share for a couple of minutes of the Lord's Supper, the night before he was betrayed. And later as we come, and we're going to be taking communion a little bit differently this morning, and I'll give instruction in a few moments. But as we did, I want us to have this in our mind. Jesus says, he says, do this as often as in remembrance of me. And this morning as we come, as we commemorate on a Good Friday, this is the annual time where we come and we remember what was accomplished, what was done, what was sacrificed on the cross for our behalf. And really when when we think about this, it, it commemorates one of the saddest and one of the most painful experiences that anyone could experience, and that is death by crucifixion. We are called to come and we are called to contemplate and to take the Lord's Supper to remember his death and then Sunday is coming, his resurrection until he comes again. 
this idea of crucifixion is, is one of the worst that anyone could experience at that time. It, it was so offensive that writers like Cesario said it, it shouldn't even be mentioned, it shouldn't even be spoken about. Other writers like Tacitus said that it would be excruciating, horrible, the wor worst possible death anyone could experience. The Romans, they, they used this as a form of execution, but they didn't invent crucifixion. It was invented by the Persians, and the Persians passed it on to the Carthaginians, and, and the Romans learned this horrible act of crucifixion. And they took it as a means of capital punishment for, for non-Roman citizens. Roman citizens were exempt of this horrific death. It says historically that even women and children were not allowed to observe what was done in crucifixion. It was typically reserved for someone who had committed the highest crimes against Caesar. And that happened, we believe, on this day, on Good Friday, and that's what we come and remember, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, we read this this morning, innocent, no fault, no blame, nothing in him, he was given this criminal's death. I want us to consider this verse that I'm going to read in a moment about what one man can do. Someone once said, one man with a backbone is, ready, is better than a thousand men with a wishbone. A lot of people can want to do something. A lot of people can will to do something, have a little bit of a drive to say, I, I will accomplish this. But what we read in scripture is that Jesus didn't just hope. He did. He acted. He went to the cross. He fulfilled what needed to be fulfilled. He said, it is finished. As Paul the Apostle says in Romans, and we've been studying that on Sunday mornings, one man can, can ruin everything. This is the, the sin of Adam and the original sin. But another man, Jesus Christ, can come and remedy everything. One man can come and bring the salvation that we need. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And then reading on in verse 15, it says, But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the results of God's gracious gift is very different from the results of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to us being able to be right with God even though we're guilty of many sins. One man with a backbone, one man who, who came for a purpose and knew his purpose and came and he set captives free and he came and he made the way to the Father. And essentially the theme of all of Scripture is about this one man, about Jesus Christ. And, and what we know is that this isn't just a man. It's not just a man, but this is God in flesh. This is what makes the difference that this one man is able to accomplish what no other man can accomplish. And that's what Jesus did on the cross is what we're commemorating today. I want us to look at the night before his crucifixion. We believe a Thursday night, so we should say, that Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. The very next day was Friday, the Friday of the Passover ceremony, this Passover, where lambs were going to be slaughtered for the sins of the people, where they could remember God's grace and his mercy of Passover from, and the deliverance from Exodus. And in Judea on that Friday would be Passover, And a lot of times we read the Bible and we might wonder, well, why would Jesus having Passover meal then on a Thursday? 
Why is Jesus celebrating the Passover on a Thursday when his disciples, with his disciples, if on Friday was the actual day of sacrifice? Well, it's because the Mishnah said that the Jews up north, the Galilean Jews, where Jesus was from, celebrated it on Thursdays. Judean Jews celebrated it on Friday. So Jesus came and he joined with his followers on the Thursday in the upper room. And they prepared themselves and they began to have the Passover meal. This was a Jewish tradition. This was celebrating and there was nothing out of the ordinary at this point yet. So Jesus' disciples were, were just following their master's direction, said, go and, and find a lamb, bring it back here. We're going to eat together. We're going to commemorate Passover together. Now, every year, Jewish families, and they still do, gather together and they celebrate, commemorate, think back to what happened in Egypt hundreds of years before, centuries before, when their forefathers were slaves for 400 years, how they were delivered, how God miraculously showed the mercy and grace. They spread the blood of the lamb over the, the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over their home. And it was the final, really, plague of Egypt. Pharaoh's heart let them go, and he let them escape. And so they commemorate, they remember this Passover meal and Jesus is celebrating this annual feast with his friends, and he's about to reorient them, though, how he's about to give them a new meaning of what this Passover is really about, that it's about him. Do this as often in remembrance of me. No longer look back at just the deliverance of Egypt, but look back at this day. Look back to this deliverance that I'm about to accomplish on the cross. So they gathered in the upper room. They gathered together, and this is where I want to read this morning, from John chapter 13. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were there in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon, son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. Just a little history lesson of Jewish custom. <laughs> Every year when families get together and they celebrate the Passover, a, a child is designated in the family to ask the father a question. It, it's always asked, and the question is this, what makes this night different from all other nights? What makes this night different from all other nights? And through the evening, the question is answered by by the one hosting the meal, usually the matriarch or the father, in this case, at this Last Supper, Jesus was hosting the meal. And maybe one of his disciples were designated to ask that question, and they asked their master, they asked Jesus, what is it that makes tonight different than all other nights? And that's a very good question. And let me answer that question by saying there are three things that, that make this night different from all other nights. First is the timing. Second, the gathering. And third, the serving. First of all, the timing. What we're told it was before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come. That, that phrase, he knew his hour had come. At Passover time, Jewish people would, would come into the city, come into Jerusalem from all over, where well, willing and able-bodied men would, would bring their families and bring their homes, and they would come into Jerusalem where, where they would sacrifice a lamb, where, where they would go to the temple to get a sacrificed lamb. They would eat it together and commemorate and remember the Passover. And on the Friday of Passover, when the hour arrived, the priests would begin to sacrifice the lambs at a certain time, at a certain hour, to remember the safety and the sacrifice from Exodus. 
And one of those lambs made it way, its way to the upper room, and the disciples and Jesus were eating this lamb and commemorating this Passover, but little did they know at that table was also another lamb. As John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the timing was Passover. It, it was the perfect time. And it also says this, as we just read, it says, when Jesus knew his hour had come. It's a common phrase, especially in John's gospel. He uses this phrase a lot. Six times in John's gospel, we read about his hour. As if he's on a time clock, as if he's keeping perfect punctuality to the will of God, to the purpose of why he came. He knew this was the hour. He began his ministry by saying something similar. He was at a feast in Galilee, uh, in Cana, and his mother came to him and said, there's no more wine at the wedding, if we remember that account. And he said, well, why are you bothering me with this? My hour has not yet come. A couple of times when, when he had been visiting the temple in Jerusalem, the authorities tried to grab him and arrest him, but it said no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Finally, in John chapter 12, it's the last time he visits the city of Jerusalem. He enters the city of Jerusalem and he says, the hour has come. He begins, as he comes in Jerusalem, he begins to declare, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he said, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this purpose I have come for this hour. It was always about the hour. It was always about his perfect timing for humanity. And because he kept perfect time and he was making sure that this time would be specifically orchestrated for him to be able to pour out his last commands and his last instructions for his disciples, he knew that his hour had come. And this is why the Gospel of John devotes no less than seven chapters in the Gospel of John to just the last 24 hour period of of Jesus' life. Five of those seven chapters are just about what happens in the upper room. Five chapters of them about the meeting in the upper room the night before. So we can see here that the, the focus of the gospel writers is about cultivating, bringing it to this hour, this most specific, most precious, most powerful, history-changing, life-changing hour. It's his hour. So what makes this night different from all other nights? The timing makes it different. Romans 5, 6 to 8, we, we read a number of weeks ago. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Secondly, this morning, the gathering makes a difference that night. It says that Jesus gathered his own. We, we know from Jesus' ministry that he was usually surrounded by people. People coming to see him be set free, be healed. Hear, hear from his, the teaching and hearing from the word of God. But on this night, the night before he, he died on the cross, he, he was very specific about who he had about, around him. It says he gathered his own, his 12 disciples. He brought them in. That's the description of his own. His friends, his disciples, his own people, those close 12 disciples followers of Christ that he had been with for the last three and a half years of his adult life as he was ministering he gathers his own and while he gathers his own in the upper room there's no crowds just them it's not a public event this is not a synagogue service this isn't a church service or an evangelical campaign it's not the place where he's on the mountaintop preaching and healing Jesus gathers his own so what does Jesus do? He, he gets alone with his disciples to give them final instructions. 
And this is one of the commands he gives them, a new command. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus deemed it the right hour, his hour, the right crowd, the right people around him. And this is what he chose to speak into their life and give them this new command. I don't think that they fully comprehend and fully grasped until after the death on the cross what that love looked like. But he told them, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. He, he calls each one of us disciples to follow him. Just like in that upper room, who he has around him, who he is called to be in relationship with him matters. He has called you and he's called I. He's called us to be followers and disciples of him. He wants to gather us to himself that we might have life. He came that no one should perish. That's what made this night different, is that Jesus had begun the calling, begun the call for the church to come, begun the call for people to come and to be saved. All who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. That's what makes this gathering different. That's what makes this night different than any other night. Finally, this morning, the serving makes it different. The serving. It says he called the 12 disciples to himself. Then he began to show them right there and then. He didn't wait till the next day. He began to show them what sacrificial love looked like. It says that after supper, he got up, he took off his tunic, and he began to wash their feet. Who, who washes feet? <laughs> the servant does. He begins to show them that he is willing to give it all for them, to serve them, and then the next day, even on to death. That's the pattern. And back in those days, they, did, they didn't have closed toe shoes like we do. They didn't have showers and baths to wash their feet. You, you've probably heard this before, but I mean, they had open toe sandals. They were walking through some pretty gross stuff. And let me remind you that, that this is a borrowed room. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, let's find a room. And so there was no wait staff. There was no other servants. There was nobody there who... And Jesus, who, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who should have been served himself, he's the one who gets up and begins to serve. And there's another element that you need to know about and you probably know about. It's not mentioned in John's gospel, but it is in some of the other gospel accounts. It says, as they sat down, as, as Jesus and his disciples sat down for the Passover meal, the disciples started arguing with each other about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And probably right there in the middle of the argument, Jesus didn't start rebuking them and correcting them and yelling at them or <laughs> saying, guys, Probably right there in the middle of the argument, he, as people are saying, I'm awesome. No, I, no I'm the better one. I, I'm better than you. Jesus got up and began to wash feet. Now, what's interesting about Jesus doing that is that none of the disciples interviewed, probably the disciples there, if you ask them, would you be willing to wash Jesus' feet, the master's feet, they would probably say, sure, yes, he is worthy of us washing his feet. But I bet if you asked one of the disciples, hey, hey, Peter, would you wash Jesus' feet? He would say, absolutely. You asked John, he said, well, yeah, I would do it. And these disciples, they, they don't think about doing that. They don't think about serving their master. They don't think about the custom and taking care of the one who deserves the glory and, and the honor. But they're there busy arguing about who's more awesome than everyone else. Can, can you imagine that argument for a second? You know, here's Peter going, you know, I'm going to be the rock on which the church is built, right? And Thomas is saying, well, I doubt it. And, and John is saying, well, I'm the one Jesus loved. And Judas is saying, well, well, maybe if you give me some money, then I would wash some feet. Uh, but it's Jesus that gets up and he starts to wash feet. 
It says in verse 1, he knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world. The father, having loved his own who were there in the world, he loved them to the end. Or he demonstrated to them the full extent of his love. And something else that jumped out to me, that in, in verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, that he had come from God and he was going to God. Jesus understood who he was. He, he knew he, was, he had all authority. He, he deserved all honor and all glory. In other words, he realized who he was. He realized where he had come from. He understood where he was going. He knew all the power and the authority. Remember in Matthew 28, Jesus said to his disciples, all authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus knows who he is. But he gets up and he washes the disciples' feet. The one who has all power and all authority in the world, in heaven and on earth, is found in an upper room, down on his knees, as a servant king. He washes feet. Why? I don't think it's just because their feet were dirty. But here's why. When you know who you are, you don't have to prove who you are. He, he knew he had all authority. He knew he had all power. He knew he had come from God. He knew he was going to God. And he gladly took the role of a servant. He was not trying to impress them. He wasn't involved in this conversation of I'm the greatest, you're the greatest, who's the greatest. He was just trying to love them. Now there's something else before we go into communion this morning. Is that I believe that Jesus didn't wash their feet just to be a good example to them. That, that was part of it. He did that as a good example to each one of us of what it means to, to be sacrificial in our love. But I don't think the purpose was, hey, boys, do you, do you see what I'm doing? I want to make sure that you watch and do exactly like I do. I don't think it was just for that. I, I think what he was doing was he was acting out a parable, that he had used word and parables so many times, and he had spoken about vines and branches. He had spoken about vineyards. He had spoken about lost sons who came home. And Jesus, I think, was putting into action a, a parable right there in front of them. He says he rose up from supper, just as in Philippians it says, he, he, he rose up from his throne of glory, and he came down to this earth to put on flesh, to be one of us, to be a servant. He, he got up, he rose up from supper, he laid aside his garments. I think he was very intentional in what he was doing and saying, this I've done before. Remember, I was in heaven and I laid apart, laid aside my garments so that I might come down and serve. Paul said to paraphrase Philippians, Jesus laid aside his prerogatives, his glory, his authority, his deity, and he girded himself, in a sense, in this parable, with a towel of service. He put on the apron of a servant. Even as he has clothed himself with human skin and he came into our world to live among us, he then began to wash the disciples' feet. And soon, even more powerful than that, he would die on a cross and take away the disciples' sin and make a way for the whole world to come to the Father. And so he was acting out a parable of what his whole ministry was about sacrifice, about suffering, about love, the full extent of his love, that there's, he, he was willing to lay it all down for them. And this, I believe, is what's different from Christianity and, and every other world religion. Other world religions ask us to suffer. You need to inflict pain on yourself or, or come and chastise yourself or that's bondage. God says, I will inflict pain on myself for you. Religions say, no, 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 you need to make a pilgrimage. You need to crawl on your knees. You need to beat yourself up. You need to touch the statue. You need to kiss their feet. Say the thing over and over again. Well, but why? Because it's essentially about us saving ourselves. We're trying to save ourselves, and you can't save yourself, not by works, but by faith. And so Paul said, by his mercy, he saved us. And I think that's a big difference. 
And I think Jesus was showing that, that, that this isn't about them coming and serving him. Yes, that should be our response. Once we were in relationship, we would want to serve. We want to honor the Lord. We want to worship him. We can't help but come into his presence and give him glory and adoration. But God says, I will suffer for you. And this is why it's called Good Friday. In the world, I think people might ask, like, well, why, why Good Friday? We watched that video at the beginning. Why are you celebrating the death of your founder? What's so good about that? Well, the results are good. Let, let me remind you, today is Friday. But three days later, three days later, death could not hold him, that the grave could not contain him, that the servant king who, who had all authority and all power took his rightful place, rose up as the lion, was slain as a lamb and began to take his authority and conquered death itself. I'll leave you on that cliffhanger for a day or two until Sunday morning. But as we come this morning, I want to transition into a time of communion. We're going to take elements that testify and remember. He says, do this in remembrance of me until I come again. To testify that Jesus has washed, not, not just feet, but washed us by the blood of the Lamb. He washed us clean of all our sin. But I have a question for you. Has he? Has he done that for you? Is Christianity something that you just observe? Or think about a Good Friday, maybe Easter, maybe Christmas, but, but it's not really that serious to you? Because I'm more and more convinced that Christianity is about surrender. It's about laying down our lives. He went to death for you and he's asking you to live for him and what I love is that not only that not only is it just in our will and us making our decision but he then gives us his holy spirit to help us do that every day Jesus never commanded that people follow him he never coerced he never twisted arms but he always invited them and the invitation today includes a decision that everyone has to make so I ask you today, maybe it's just reflecting and remembering and being thankful again for what Jesus did on the cross. Maybe you're, you're listening today or maybe you're here this morning and you haven't put your full hope and trust in him. But, but it's your choice to make. He, he won't force you to do it. He might invite you to do it. You'll discover Christianity isn't, isn't an entity or religion or a practice or a tradition. It's the person of Jesus Christ who we want to live in relationship with. But when I married my wife, I came into a covenant relationship with her. I want to live life with her. I want to grow with her. I want to learn from her. I want to spend time with her. This is what it's about. And not just about saying Jesus lives in my heart, but wanting to live a life worthy of what he has done for us. So if you have said yes to him, or if you haven't said yes to him, I want to give you an opportunity before we take communion today to just bow in a word of prayer. Father, we've considered what you did on that night before you were betrayed. The night before you were betrayed, you, you came and you brought your friends together at just the right time, at the perfect hour. You brought them into a place where you began to pour into their lives and begin to show and demonstrate a heart of a servant. God, you loved them. It was your hour, and in that hour, you served them. You showed them that, that the way to the Father is through laying down our lives coming and humbly bowing our knee and laying it all down. So, Father, today, if there's someone here or those, Lord God, who we may have made that commitment before, Lord, but, but we're not in that position of bowing before you and submitting to your lordship. Lord, come and forgive us of all sins. 
God, today on Good Friday, what, what a day to, to make that covenant, make that commitment to you, Lord, to choose to answer your invitation. Truly, that's a Good Friday to be able to look back on. That was the day of salvation. <laughs> so, Lord, may you speak to us today by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we confess even now before we take communion, it says in your word, Lord God, that we need to examine ourselves. We need to search ourselves. We need to see, Lord God, if there's anything that, that is unworthy. We, we come and we confess that right now, Lord God. And then, Lord, we want to come with thanksgiving and awe and adoration. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord God, for the Good Friday. We thank you for what you accomplished on the cross. <laughs> then, Lord, as we celebrate in a few days, we, we thank you for, wow, for the authority, the power you had, Lord God, <laughs> to show us not just death, but also what it means to live. And we can live with you and live in you and live empowered by you. So, God, we thank you. We can't thank you enough, Lord God. It truly is a good Friday because of what you did for us. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. What we'd like to do, so today we're going to do communion a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to lead in just a song. And as we do, as we're leading in the song, I, I want you to come and, and take one of the emblems here this morning. There's lots to go around, I think. Come and take one of the emblems. And as you do, it may seem a little odd or you might feel kind of awkward doing it. But what I would encourage you to do is come and bow before the cross. Play, kneel before the cross. Thanking Jesus, just like he came and he bent himself down and he served and washed feet. Come and take the emblem and come and just reflect for a moment at the cross and then... You can go back to your seat, and we'll lead you in partaking of communion in just a few moments. But as we do today, I want this to just be a moment of reflection, a moment of remembrance, that we remember what Jesus did on the cross. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the
Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross for us. We thank you, Jesus. It says in Scripture on the night that he was betrayed, <laughs> at, that, at that supper that we were just reflecting on, Jesus took bread he broke the bread. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. Let us do that together this morning as we do, just to reflect again on the Savior King. Jesus who went through this, this death, bore it all and took it all he knew he knew what it took and because he loved us even when we were yet sinners Jesus died for us we thank you Jesus thank you Jesus
in the same way as they were finishing dinner, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood that I pour out for you for the remission of sins, for, for the sins of all people. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you do. as we finish this morning we want to lead in one last chorus lead me to the cross just another song of reflection of commitment of devotion to the Lord Lord, as we go from this place, God, may our hearts just be in tune. May you remind us over and over, Lord God, 
of what you've done for us, Lord. How you came, Lord God, at just the right time. At just the right hour, Lord God, when all humanity was groaning and we could not do it on our own. God, you came. You came to set us free. You came to bring liberty and victory, Lord God, to those who were captive at just the right time. So, Lord, as we go among, about our weekend, Lord, as we come together again on Sunday, Lord, may our hearts just be in a sense of an attitude of worship and adoration, Lord God, because you did not stay in that grave. You did not stay dead, Lord God. But you rose again. So God, even though today is Friday, even though, Lord God, we reflect on, on your death, God, we know that resurrection life is right around the corner. So God, be with us, be all around us as we go from this place. Be with family gatherings, Lord God. May your presence just be known, Lord. May we take on that very attitude, Lord, that as you did, to be a servant. Lord God, we thank you in your precious name.